Good evening. My name is Tim Pratt. I am the chair of Shoreview's Environmental Quality Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to our April speaker series event, Food Too Good to Waste. Uh, as we plan these types of things, we look at things, stories that are in the headlines, and there are a lot of reports last fall about all of the uh, food that does not get eaten, and stories of up to potentially 40% of food doesn't make it to our stomachs, whether it be left in the field because it can't be harvested for whatever reasons, uh, it's ugly fruit, so it doesn't want to be, people don't want to sell it, uh, it gets into our refrigerator and goes by the best buy date, and we think if it's the next day, if we consume it, that we'll get some weird disease that we read about on the internet or something. Um, there are lots of reasons, and uh, Chris, our guest speaker, is not going to try and solve all of the world's food problems this evening, because we only have an hour. Um, but he is going to take, if you will, a bite-size portion of the uh, issue and talk about uh, what we as consumers can do. Uh, when you think about it, when we have food that we purchase, um, and I heard an analogy that's kind of like you go and you buy lunch, and then you take and you throw it out, and then you go and buy another lunch, and then that's what you eat. That's kind of what we're doing in a way, and wasting money by uh, throwing food out that's still perfectly good to eat. And so uh, Chris is going to share with us some ideas on what we as consumers can do to save money by saving food. And thus, Food Too Good to Waste is the title of the uh, presentation. Let me give you a little background on Chris, uh, uh, Chris's bio here. Christopher Goodwin joined the staff at Eureka Recycling in the fall of 2007. And since then, he has worked on both the customer relations and the communication teams to strengthen Eureka's connection to the residents they serve and the community that supports zero waste. Now, prior to working at Eureka Recycling, he spent 17 years as the head of the Interpretive Education Department at the Bell Museum of Natural History. And there he built sustainable education programs and trained dozens of eager college students the skill of natural history interpretation and informal learning. He has a great interest and passion in helping people see the truth that there really is no such thing as waste. Really, no such thing. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Goodwin. Oops, wrong one. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, present on preventing wasted food. Um, the first thing I want to start out with is the average household um, in this area wastes $96 worth of food each month. That's for a regular family house. $96 worth of food that they purchased with the intention of eating it, but the clock ran out before they could and it got thrown away. <clears throat> so that's around $1,200 a year in your average family's pocket um, that could have been saved if a little bit more um, tips and tools were used to maybe like extend that lifespan of that food so that you could actually eat it. Eureka Recycling um, is a nonprofit, zero waste social enterprise. And what that means is we exist um, as a nonprofit not just to generate profit, but also to accomplish our mission, which is to demonstrate that there is no such thing as waste. And we really do believe that. Um, and when you get into zero waste, even an inch deep, what you find is that with just making a few changes in how we produce things, how we design them, and how we use them, the pile of things that we consider waste right now actually goes away. And you don't have to worry about how many trucks you need to drive it around or what facility you're going to take it to because you've just prevented it from existing in the first place. And one of the areas that we work on with that is around organics and around things that if you let them be, they will turn back into dirt because dirt is where they came from. Um, and preventing wasted food is a piece of that. 
Um, as an organization, Eureka has a lot of faces. We do a lot of things. Most people think of us as the recycling company because we drive around every day with 30 billboards that say Eureka Recycling on the side, and so we're picking up recycling, and that's what people think of us as. But we do a lot of other things as well. We have a lot of advocacy um, elements and policy development elements to our organization. We're at the state capitol right now, um, literally right now, our Eureka staff at the state capitol, talking about all kinds of zero waste programs. Um, we also have the Twin Cities Free Market, which is something that everybody here has access to. If you have a couch or something that you don't need anymore and it's still good, somebody else wants it. So don't throw it away. Just put a listing on the free market and that person who wants it will come take it away and it doesn't cost you anything. And we have lots of other programs like that where we promote different ways that we can handle whatever we have that we don't want anymore in a way that doesn't allow it to become waste because it doesn't become waste until a human being decides it's going to be waste. And we're human beings and we can make that decision or not. <clears throat> so in terms of what zero waste is, in terms of Eureka as an organization, zero waste is basically a concept that says, why can't we design our economy and our lives and how we function with nature as a model? Right now, we are using a very human-created linear model for how we do things in the world, where we, we obtain resources from the Earth, we make them into things, we use them for usually a very short period of time, and then we throw them away and we go back to nature and get more resources. It's very linear and it always ends with discards that is waste. Nature doesn't move like that. Nature doesn't function like that. If you took all the ants in the whole world and put them on a scale and weighed them, and all the people on the wor in the world and put them on a scale and weighed them, the ants outweigh the people but there's no such thing as an ant landfill. And the reason is because, because ants are part of nature. And in nature, the, out, the, the, the leftovers of any one part of the system in nature is the feedstock for the next part of the system in nature. And talking about preventing wasted food and zero waste composting basically mimics that. So what's in our waste right now? <clears throat> A little over half of it is the same thing that's in our recycling. It just got put in the wrong container. So if you think about it, think of all the waste in Minnesota, imagine it in a big pile. Half of that pile is recyclable. It's exactly the same stuff that you put in your recycling bin. It's just for whatever reason, people didn't have access to recycling. They didn't know it was recyclable. It got put in the wrong pile. About 25% of what's in the waste right now is compostable. It is organic. It wants to turn back into dirt. Um, and that's the portion that we're going to be talking about today. Um, as I said, preventing wasted food education is a part of the larger zero waste composting program that Eureka has um, done pilots on and put together in terms of best practices. So the first thing you want to do whenever you're trying to reduce waste is figure out how much of that waste could be prevented in the first place. Then if you've dealt with that, what's left, banana peels, apple cores, things like that that you can't eat, then you have to figure out a way to do the composting with that, first in your backyard, then with a collection program for things you can't backyard compost. But it all starts with the foundation of preventing the food from becoming waste in the first place. And the tricky thing about prevention as a tool for getting to zero waste, as a tool for waste reduction, is that it's really hard to measure the existence of something that never became an ex in, into existence. So policy people at, at the PCA and other places are confounded by the idea that they can't show what a good job they did because they can't weigh the thing that never existed in the first place. And so prevention always gets kind of a bad rap and it doesn't get enough attention, even though the dollars and the time that you put into prevention have a much greater environmental impact than anything that you put investments in further down the line because you don't need a truck to drive around nothing. You don't need a facility to process nothing. It's something that you just prevented from existing in the first place. So what is the difference between wasted food and food waste? Wasted food is something that's not the banana peel, it's the banana itself. It's not the apple core, it's the whole apple. It's not the chicken bones, it's the whole chicken. So when something could have been used, could have been eaten, and it wasn't, then that is, wa is wasted food, as opposed to just food waste, which is banana peels and things like that. Um, and the impacts of, of all that waste of food that could have been eaten are pretty profound. Not only is it the time and money that you spent going to the store and buying it and putting it in your refrigerator, but you're the last piece of that puzzle. Think about everything that happened to get that strawberry into your refrigerator in the first place. All of the transportation of all those strawberries on a truck, all the fertilizer that went into that soil that grew that, that strawberry, all the water that was put on that field, only to end up turning fuzzy and getting thrown away. There's a tremendous amount of resources that went into bringing that food to you. And when you allow it to become waste, all that was without purpose. Um, 
So if you just think about a pizza, we did this with a bunch of kids this morning, a bunch of fifth graders at a school. We said, okay, think of your favorite food, and they all said pizza. And then we said, okay, we're going to break you into groups, and you're going to pick one ingredient. Everybody pick a different ingredient that is in your pizza. And then I want you to think about where that came from and all the people and all the energy and all the resources that went into making that pizza. And the, the kids that had the most fun with it were the most gruesome because they picked pepperoni. And they were very, very, very interested in making sure the details of how a pepperoni becomes a pepperoni were covered in, in graphic detail. But it really was a good exercise for the kids to realize that a pizza is a pizza and it tastes real good. But there's hundreds of things that make that pizza a pizza. And each of them came from somewhere. And people had to do something and spend money and spend treasure and time and resources to get that into existence. So finish your pizza. I mean, it's, it's really... That's the parent version. Um, so when we throw all these resources away, not only have we wasted the energy that went into them, there's con con consequences to that um, waste and what we do with it. So if you put it in a landfill, it gets covered up, and then it breaks down, but it breaks down anaerobically, which means it is bacteria that give, don't give off C oxygen, they give off CO2 and, and methane. And methane is a g greenhouse gas that's 20 times better at trapping heat in the atmosphere than CO2 is. So you're basically taking that wasted food and you're turning it into greenhouse gases. Um, if you incinerate it instead, basically if you think of food waste, it's very wet. It doesn't burn very well. So you're taking something that is not a very good thing to burn and you're sending it to an incinerator, which decreases the efficiency of that incinerator and creates more pollution. Um, so either option that you have to what to do with the waste, food waste is, doesn't really belong in either of those two. It doesn't, it doesn't help. It's not a useful fuel. It's not a useful thing in a landfill either. And what we really want to do with this, this material, this, this compostable stuff, is to turn it into compost. Once we've prevented what we can prevent, what we end up composting, we want to turn it into dirt so that you can grow the next generation of food from that. And I think one of the really important things to remember is that if you look at how much soil there is on the planet to grow all the food that every human being is going to need, a good analogy is to think of an apple as the earth. Now imagine quartering that apple so it's in four pieces. Three of those four pieces are water. It's ocean. So we can't grow food there, at least most food. The one quarter that's left, cut that in half. And the first half is mountains and deserts that you can't grow food in. And the last quarter is where all of the soil that we grow, all of the food for every person on the planet, plus anybody else living on the planet. Um, and so soil is something we dr drastically need to maintain and to be reproducing and making more of so that we can grow tomorrow's food. Currently, the, the food system is such that we grow a lot of food, we process it, we send it to the supermarket, people buy it, people put it on their table, and then it goes to waste. A more zero waste model for what to do with it is you get it from the grocery store or the, the farmer's market, you take it home, you eat everything that you can eat, what's left, you backyard compost what you can, then what you can't backyard compost, you have a collection program to take it to a commercial facility where it's broken down into dirt. And then the really important thing is that that dirt then goes back to local farms to grow the next generation of food. That's a zero waste cycle to do with organics, that 25% of what's in the trash. That's the cycle that you want to use, is you want to turn it back into dirt, dirt from where it came. Um, another really important aspect of the education we do around preventing wasted food is a lot of the more immediate and accessible um, items that you can use to store your food are all made out of plastic. And there's a lot of um, problems with storing food in plastic, especially if you're using that same container, or same Tupperware container to then heat it up in the microwave or put it in the freezer to freeze it. Whenever you heat or cool plastics, the chemicals that are in the plastic leach out and get into the food. And so plastic is not a very good way to store food. <clears throat> So much better ways are to use glass. Glass is an excellent um, storage medium for any kind of food, anything that's going to be consumed by people, because glass is inert. It doesn't leach anything into the food, um, and it works better than plastic. I'll mention also the paper bag to store mushrooms in is a tip. There's going to be a whole bunch of tips coming up, but um, the mushrooms last longer if you store them in a paper bag because they're able to breathe, um, and, and they can give off or take in moisture, and that keeps them from turning bad. Um, and there are some resources on both Eureka Recycling's website and on this other website, My Plastic Free Life, um, that give you tips on what other things you can use to store food in and also gives you more details about why plastic is not a safe thing to be storing food in. 
<clears throat> so now into some tips for what you can do to reduce the amount of food waste that you generate. Um, first, uh, and this one is, I put this one first because it's the least fun. <laughs> it's sort of like keep track. Um, so there's a saying that if you want to manage something, the first thing you have to do is measure it. And so keeping track of exactly what you're buying and what you're throwing away gives you a sense of exactly what the status is of your particular household and how much stuff um, that is not getting used at your house. And that could be a really... Um, for some people, a very motivating tool because when they're actually, you know, we have a sense that, yeah, I threw away that, that banana the other day, well, well. But when you actually monetize it or did, you know, get a list together of exactly what went away that you paid for that you didn't end up eating, um, that's a piece of information that people can find a little bit jarring in terms of like, wow, we really did throw away half the stuff we bought at the grocery store last week. Okay. Um, Eureka has on its website, um, it's a makedirtnotwaste.org. Oh, it'll come up the address again later. Um, some really useful tips, a downloadable PDF of storage tips for what to do with different types of food and how you can make them last longer. They work. We've tried them. We've tested them. Um, we've focus grouped them with people to find out, you know, did you try this? Did it really work? Um, and we gathered them from all over. And the one thing that is amazing is that every time we go out to do tabling or do a presentation on preventing wasted food, we get about two tips out before people start wanting to share their tips. This is what my grandma taught me about how to keep the asparagus fresh. And this is how you, we keep the lettuce from going bad at our house. Every single household has tips to share. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about a, a program that we're doing with our Green Corps member that is about gathering up everybody's knowledge about different food tips and sharing it with other people. Okay, another tip about bananas. Um, don't store bananas next to all your other fruit um, because bananas give off a certain gas which increases the speed by which other fruits ripen and rot. Um, and so you should keep bananas away from the other fruit um, because then the bananas and the fruit will last longer. This is my favorite. Um, I like cheese and crackers or cheese and, and bread and I always have about half a baguette that then is all stale the next day. If you take that baguette and you just run it under cold water, literally just like that, and then shake it off and then put it in a warm oven for a couple minutes, it comes right back. It's as fresh as the day you bought it. It's an amazing tip if you, if you have bread at your house that goes bad too soon. Cucumbers, there's a lot of um, tips about different types of vegetables that if you store them upright instead of in a bag in the, in the drawer at the bottom of the refrigerator, they last not just a little bit longer, a lot longer, like twice as long, three times as long, four times as long, depending on what kind of vegetable it is that you're talking about. And again, you want to store them away from other fruits because, again, like bananas, they have the gas. Some tips about eggs. If you want to know, if, uh, first of all, to keep track of eggs, either write the date you bought them on the carton or even write it right on the shell so that when you look at your eggs, you know which ones are older and which ones are newer. If you want to test an egg to see if it's still fresh, float it in a, a little bit of water. Um, and you can see that if it's flat on the bottom, it's fresh. If it's on a, you know, flat on the side on the bottom, if it starts to float a little but it's still touching the bottom, then use it for purposes where you're not making like a, a beautiful egg that you're going to eat for breakfast, but use it in baking and things like that. And if it floats, don't eat it. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people know about this one, but we all do it anyway. Um, milk stored in the door goes bad faster because the door is the warmest place in your refrigerator. And it's constantly exposed to the warmer air every time you open and close. So you want to store your, your milk further away towards the back of the refrigerator and it'll last longer. This is most people's number one. Everybody who's tried it has said, I didn't think this was going to be a big deal, but once we did it, we threw away so much less food. You just put a box in your refrigerator that says use it up, or you can call it whatever you want. Call it the happy box. But it's the box where you put the things that are closest to going bad. And then when you open the door and say, what should we have for dinner? Use those things in whatever it is you're going to decide to make that night. Um, that way they're not hidden and mixed in with all the other things, some of which are much newer than they are. You're just making the, the stuff more prominent that you want to use faster. So you don't have to dig. It's right there. It's good to have an inventory of what you have, um, especially if you're about to go shopping. I can't tell you how many times I have gone to the store to buy something and then come home to put it away, and there's three of them already in the, ca in the cabinet. Um, 
then now you're pretty much going to waste some of that because you're not going to be able to eat it all. And you're probably even going to buy one more before. <laughs> so if you have an inventory of what you're buying and what's in there that you can access easily, it makes shopping easier. You're not buying things that you don't need because you already have it. Um, meal planning is also something that helps because it's a little bit less spontaneous to, you know, know what you're going to have for dinner next Thursday. Maybe I don't want that when I get to next Thursday. <laughs> it's, it's not a law. You can change your mind. But if you meal plan out for a week and you shop for that, you're buying for what you know you're going to use and what you're going to need. Um, I don't usually meal plan, and so I tend to buy things where I'm buying them because I want that that day, and then I don't end up eating it or using it because... I bought it because that's what I wanted on Tuesday, but when it gets to Thursday, I don't want it anymore, but I still have it. <laughs> meal planning just is a tool to be able to say, okay, what do I know I'm going to want and what do I know I'm going to buy? And then I don't need to buy anything that's not on the list. Everybody should share any recipes they have with how to use leftovers, um, how to make new meals out of old stuff. Um, it's one of the things that we get a lot of, of people sharing is their grandmother's recipe for, okay, we had a really bumper crop of zucchini. We have 16 bushels of zucchini in the garage. Who got, who's got a good recipe for zucchini bread, zucchini cake, zucchini soup, zucchini a la mode? <laughs> Anything that you can have a recipe for things that you end up with a lot of or things or recipes for leftover turkey dinner or leftover whatever you have that is leftover from the night before. Um, we have some of those on the website, and we also are, it's one of the things that we're hoping to get from people to share is good recipes for common things that people have left over half of something that you don't need anymore. So there are a lot of resources on our Make Dirt Not Waste website. Um, our original work in preventing wasted food came about because the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and, and Eureka were in conversations about the fact that Nobody's ever done any good education on preventing wasted food. It's, we're, it's all of a sudden starting to be talked about. You hear about it all over the place. But when you go and search for it, unless you're in the UK, everything always starts in the UK. There wasn't any resources. And so we got a grant from the PCA to put together a lot of resources and basically just pull all kinds of different communities of people together to gather their knowledge, put together packets of tools and tips, have them use the tools and tips, and then give us feedback on ones they thought worked and ones they thought were a waste of time. And all that can be found on our makedirtnotwaste.org website. You can also get more information on Eureka Recycling's website. And we have a hotline, a zero waste hotline. Um, so if you ever have questions about backyard composting or about recipes for things and how you can you know, keep carrots to last longer, all those kind of things, you can just call our hotline and every single person who answers it is trained on the resources that we have around composting and around other things like that too. And that's all, if you have questions. Chris, do you have any information about the supply chain for some of these foods? Um, Tim mentioned the ugly food that doesn't make it. Uh, do you have any information to share on that? I mean, I do. I'm not an expert, and there have been a lot of, of documentaries and a lot, a lot of other... Uh, articles and things like that done on just how horrific it is and how much waste there is, and it's it always everybody in the chain always blames the the person in the who someone else in the chain. So yes, I know this peach is perfectly good, but see that brown spot? No one's going to buy it, and the the store I try to sell it to is not going to buy it. So what do you want me to do? And there's a whole industry around. Um, leftover food, even at grocery stores, being sent to like food shelves and things like that. And the struggle between why don't we try to do something to reduce the amount of wasted food, but at the same time, oh, isn't it good that it's going to the food shelf? And the struggle about, you know, no, we want them to keep wasting all those peaches because then we get them. Um, and it goes all the way up the chain to we produce more than we really need. And then once we have it produced, and I think a lot of it is because you can't plan how big a harvest is going to be on something. And so you overplant and overproduce. Um, because, you know, next year it might be a drought and you might not get anything. So there, there's not a lot of control over how much is created. And then at every step in the process, you're only picking the best of the best of the best. And that's what ends up with us. But every decision that was made before that <laughs> creates wasted food. And there isn't a system in place to capture that and get it to people who need it. And there isn't a system in place to prevent it being planted in the first place. I would note, though, that Hy-Vee grocery stores have started offering 
they have a small section called ugly fruit. So those fruits that, you know, might be a little misshapen that we've been in culture that think that aren't as nutritious, that actually are, uh, they'll sell to you at a discount. So go to Hy-Vee, check it out. And I mean, that's one example of one store that's trying that out. I think something that um, most consumers undervalue is their own power. Um, and we, we, this is true not just of, of food issues, but also packaging issues. We have this conversation with people all the time when they call and say, is this recyclable? And we say, no, it's not. And But what you could do is every package you buy in the store, somewhere on that package is a 1-800-how-am-I-doing number. If you call that number and tell them, they will listen. Ten years ago, if someone called and says, I like your crackers, but I don't like your cracker box, they would have thought that was adorable. And they would have pinned it on the bulletin board and laughed about it at the Christmas party. But enough people now are starting to make that call that it's important. And they're starting to have meetings about, OK, look, our market share is going down because people just can't stand our packaging. Same thing's true for grocery stores. If you talk to them and say, why isn't there um, ugly fruit section in your store? I don't want that stuff getting wasted. You say it, then he says it, then she says it, and all of a sudden there's a meeting. <laughs> you want to get the meeting started, but the meeting doesn't happen unless you make the phone call. Can you talk a little bit about Best Buy dates? Because I know I've heard it doesn't mean that if you're a day or two past this date, you should throw it out. That's right. And they're, they're, not, they're not a legally binding, this is when this food is going to go bad, because you, you can't measure that. Um, they're really just a guideline. And, and your own nose and your own judgment is, is, better, is a good or better a guideline. Um, so they're not meant to mean that you can't, you shouldn't eat it after this date. They're just meant to mean that this is a window where we think it's beginning to get to that place. And if you think about it from a company's perspective, it's going to be the very earliest date that anything bad could possibly possibly have ever happened in the history of like 1.1 to 1.100% because legally they, they're putting a date on there <laughs> and so they're ultimately going to be as conservative in protecting themselves as possible. It probably has quite a bit of life cycle after that. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're putting that on there for maintaining their freshness. We want it to be the best tasting, absolutely perfect, whatever it is, the day that you taste it. So you don't think of us as, ooh, I didn't like that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that it's spoiled. It doesn't mean that it's bad and that if you eat it, you'll get sick. Yeah. Do you have facts and figures as to how successful the um, organic waste program is in Ramsey County? I do not for Ramsey County because I don't work with Ramsey County. Um, but from a perspective of what we've studied over the years, a drop-off program is great for the percentage of people who are willing to put that stuff into their car and take it to the drop-off. Um, in terms of the, the number of people willing to participate in that program versus a curbside collection program, they're not even close in terms of the numbers. If someone puts a card at your house and says, this is where you put your organics, or puts a, some other type of program that's collected at your house, you get a much, much, much higher participation rate. Um, Drop-offs are great to build awareness and build an understanding and start getting the ball rolling. They're nowhere near the solution. Um, and so they've been more successful than anybody thought they would be, but they're still nowhere near as successful as a curbside program would be. Not yet, no. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, most of the curbside programs that you see are in Hennepin County. And that has to do with the fact that Hennepin County has been really a player in subsidizing and doing market development to get composting programs going. The challenge with compost is you have to take it somewhere far away to process it. Nobody wants to have a giant commercial composting facility in their neighborhood. Um, so you have to haul that material a very long way. And you don't want to do it with the individual trucks that are collecting it, because then you're sending hundreds and hundreds of trucks out of town, and that makes the program way in a, ineffective in terms of cost. So what you need is a transfer station, a place where you take the material off the little trucks, put it into a big truck, and the big truck makes the long haul. And Hennepin County has that at the Brooklyn Park transfer station, where they allow organics transfer to happen there. In addition to that, they have also subsidized the tip fee. So it costs you less to dump it at Hennepin County than it will cost Hennepin County to dump it at the commercial facility. All that's done to try to stimulate companies to do the organics collection and to get the system going, because once it's going, it'll grow on its own. But you need to do that initial development. And Ramsey County just hasn't done any of that type of support. They've, they've done the drop-offs. That was, that was their choice.
put my bags in the bin out there? Do you know where it goes? Um, you can. You should check with Ramsey County to be certain. But I know that there's two different places that are where most of the commercial, where most of the compost go. One of them's in um, Empire Township. Um, down on the southeast part of the metro, and the other is in Shakopee on the southwest part of the metro. They probably have a contract with one of those two. Because that's zero waste, right? If they make it into soil, then that's zero waste. Yeah, it's on the way. The, the, ultimately, the one thing that still hasn't started to happen with most composting programs is that soil then isn't flowing back into the community. So when we piloted it in St. Paul, what we said should happen is that soil which has been created, there's this movement to grow more food locally, the urban food movement where there's food deserts in the metro area, especially in urban areas where even if you want to eat healthy, you have to go on a trek to be able to even get access to the healthy food. And when you go to the corner grocery store, you're not seeing it. So to be able to get healthy food grown in the cities, in the core cities, you can't really grow that in the soil that's there because it's contaminated. So what you need to do is you need to tr get soil from somewhere else and build raised beds. Well, if you have a composting program happening in your city, you're generating thousands and thousands of tons of soil, which should then come right back into the community and be used for that purpose. That's the one area where the programs really haven't quite started to do that yet, but it's something that we advocate for very much. I have two questions. Uh, first one is, have you looked at what the cost of transportation is of our food and what percent of it is? Because I'm always curious about grapes coming from Chile or something. I mean, what do they really cost to get here? My second question is, what did the fifth graders come up with for the source of their pepperoni? I mean, what did they think about that? I want to answer the last one second, because the first one, I don't have all, I don't have all the numbers that you're looking for for that. They, had, they have done that life cycle analysis, depending on what the particular type of food is. It goes very long. Just, and we're all used to having perfectly fresh produce in the middle of winter. It obviously didn't get grown here, so it got grown somewhere else, like California or Chile or somewhere even further. Um, and so depending on the brand, depending on the product, depending on what it is, it likely, especially in, in months where that's not in season, has traveled thousands and thousands of miles. And, and that transportation cost is huge. Um, and I, don't I can't like quote you a number. Um, but I know that there's folks who have done that, um, and particularly um, some of the folks that have done documentaries on food waste actually followed the chain of things and actually interviewed people who are in the production of this food, talking about how it frustrates them, too, that so much of it gets thrown away. Because it's their time and energy that goes into growing it, only to see it on their own farm get thrown away. Yeah. It's a concept called food miles. So if you go on and Google food miles, you'll find there's a... Lots and lots of information. And in terms of the fifth graders, <laughs> they really latched onto the idea that pepperoni has pork in it. And so pork comes from animals, and you had to actually dispatch the animals <laughs> in order to get your pork. So they went into graphic detail <laughs> with pictures. And, <laughs> and Lindsay, our Green Corps member who was doing the, the training, she was just like, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I'm not their teacher. How do I stop them? <laughs> But speaking of Lindsay and uh, the Green Corps member, what she's working on is a project to gather up all the different tips and tools that different people have. And it's a contest that we're doing um, where people can submit little two minute videos of their tip for how to save the asparagus or keep the lettuce fresh or make leftovers out of meatloaf. Um, that we'll then put on our, our YouTube channel and people will like or not like. And then whoever gets the most votes, will there's prizes. Um, Things like night out um, or, or um, what do they call them, um, farmer's market dollars that we'll give to people. Um, so I encourage, you can check our website for that. There'll be a page going up at the end of this week about it. And you can, there's an online form. You submit your, your video and your information and then we'll contact you. I just have a little plug. So this Saturday um, is, Earth Day, and so they are, um, the National Sports Center is actually having Green Expo for free entrance, and so I just wanted to give a little plug because you, they're having this event, and at this event, I'm actually picking up my compost bins where I plan to utilize my, my food waste and create my own soil and, and reutilize that. And if people ever have questions about backyard composting, if, if you run into problems where your, your composter isn't working right or there's a smell or something's just not working, or you've never done it and have no idea how to start, you can call our hotline 
612 no waste and everybody who answers that can walk you through the, the most common kind of problems and how you can resolve them and, and give you some assistance. So Chris, are these your handouts? Um, they're from, I think, the, the county. Ellen brought them. Because there's handouts here and folks at home, uh, you can go to savethefood.com. We've got uh, one on how to pack your refrigerator. So Chris was talking about don't put the milk in the door. What can you put in the door? Well, you can find out there. Um, oh, some more stuff from savethefood.com talking about shopping. One of my favorites is uh, love food, hate waste, which was one of the first ones out of the UK, mm -hmm. Chris was talking about. Uh, very clever campaigns that they have come up with. They're very cheeky, if you will, as in the British would say. Uh, but they have lots and lots of recipes for what to do with uh, your leftovers. Do you have any more? Was in the back row. Well, Chris, uh, we have a little card. Oh, presents. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, kind of apropos for when we're talking about food, a yes. cutting board. These are actually from, uh, it's called Wood from the Hood. So these are naturally downed trees. Uh, this, In this case, in the city of Minneapolis, it even has the zip code there. Nice. So present there. Uh, so join me in thanking Christopher for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our speaker series for 2017. Uh, we have it on the third Wednesdays of the month in uh, January through April. So if you've got ideas what you'd like to see for next year, please talk to one of our EQC members. We've got a couple here in the audience. Um, and a reminder that we have the Green Community Awards coming up. So look for the application on the city's website, and that's for folks who are doing things, uh, conserving energy, putting in uh, uh, solar panels, or even um, we've got some folks who put in geothermal heating and cooling systems, and folks who are doing things to, uh, in terms of preserving our waters, they put in shoreline buffers, or they're replacing grass with native plantings, or things of that sort. Check all that out on the website. And uh, the deadline for application is usually right around um, Memorial Day weekend. And as we say, it's a, even though we call it an awards program, it's more of an exhibition than a competition. So we give you a little lawn stake that we, you can put in your yard. And the reason we do that is because we want you to go and make your neighbors jealous. <laughs> and they want you to ask, have them ask you, well, how can I get one? And then you tell them, and then they do it. So. Uh, look for the Green uh, Community Awards information on the website. Share your ideas for next year's uh, speaker series, and we will see you again next January. Thank you. <laughs>